Good evening, everyone. My microphone is working, I see. Yes? Good. I'm Professor Nancy Horowitz. I am the director of the Elie Wiesel Center for Jewish Studies here at Boston University. And it's my great pleasure to welcome you here tonight to this year's International Holocaust Remembrance Day commemoration. Before we get started, a quick welcome and some very profound comments from Irit Yachnes, who is the Deputy Consul General of Israel to New England. Please. Good evening, everyone. Thank you very much for joining us here today. Um, I would like to thank, first and foremost, um, our partners at the AJC and the Elie Wiesel Center and the Therese Music Foundation for making this um, evening possible and for all of you joining here today. Um, as we gather today here to mark International Holocaust Remembrance Day, um, some people still think uh, and question if this day is even necessary. Um, some question if we need the whole world to unite for a day every year and say together that never again is still very much relevant. Never again to the world's greatest genocide to repeat itself. I don't know if many of you know, but International Holocaust Remembrance Day is a result of very tedious and hard work of many, many people along the years. But for most and foremost, it's actually a promise of one son to his mother, an Israeli diplomat by the name of Roni Adam, who promised her to make the world never forget what happened. Um, Terezin was a symbol. Uh, a very symbol with a great symbolic significance in telling the story of the Holocaust. Um, it played both a part in the theater of the terror of the Nazi regime as an exemplary camp to show the world and international organizations like the Red Cross the narrative that the Nazis wanted the world to see. But also it tells the story of the resilience of the Jewish people and the Jewish spirit, which I think that is probably the most important part. The same way anti-Semitism and Jew hatred was masked in Terezin for the world to see, there are voices that try to mask it today under pretenses of freedom of speech and context. It took the world many years to take responsibility for what has happened during the Holocaust, like in the Terezin Declaration in 2009. And still, to this day, there are some who try to deny what happened then and what is happening now. This year, I stand here before you with great sorrow because I'm no longer talking just about the past, the past of the six million people who died during the Holocaust, but also with great concern with what is happening um, in our present and what is going to happen in our future, of the future of the Jewish people, the future of the Western society, and humanity in general. The October 7 massacre and the word imposed on Israel that made very clear that never again is now. Now is the time to prove that we don't say, but do. Now, the fight against anti-Semitism is more necessary than ever. Now we should choose to be on the right side of history because we have the chance. Now we can't say we didn't know or we couldn't assist because the atrocities that happened on October 7 are blasted all over social media. We owe it to them, to the six million who were murdered, burned, tortured, mutilated, and dehumanized just for being Jewish. We owe it to all the victims of the October 7 massacre who were murdered, burned, tortured, and raped, and to 136 of them who are still used as pawns just for being the citizens of the Jewish state that was established so that the Holocaust will never happen again. Back then, the Jewish people didn't have a voice, but they used different means like music to make their voice be heard. This is no longer the case. The Jewish people today have a voice and power to speak up for themselves, whether they're in Israel or here in the United States. I would like to encourage you to use that voice for yourself, for your community, and for your fellow brothers and sisters in Israel and around the world. Thank you very much for joining. Thank you, Edith. I'd like to begin by telling you just a little bit about tonight's program. Mark Ludwig will present on Musicians of Terrorism, including a short performance. We're then going to have Rob Lichen from um, AJC New England as a respondent, and then we will have a little bit of time for questions from the audience and discussion. If you would like to ask a question, please fill it out on one of the cards that you may have picked up at the uh, desk outside. If not, 
there's still time to go get a card and a pencil and just wave it around right at the end of the program and our ushers will walk around and pick up your cards. A few thoughts on tonight's program and where we are today. It's a very difficult time we're living in. I don't need to tell you that. We all know this. A time that can easily remind us of the step-by-step -step exclusions and then persecutions of several decades ago. The historical connection between the Holocaust and now is also quite specific. One of Hitler's goals was to spread murderous anti-Semitism in the Arab countries, throughout the Arab countries in the 1930s, an effort that took deep root. That genocidal anti-Semitism of the Third Reich still lives on in the relatively recent Hamas charter. How can we talk, just as one example, how can we talk about what's happening today without some thought or reference to the Holocaust? Eight years afterwards, we are surrounded by ever-increasing anti-Semitism and acts of violence against Jews. To be clear, much caution is required. The two historical periods are extremely different. Yet transgenerational memories of trauma can easily be reactivated and have been reactivated by recent events. There's a widespread failure of so many people to see, really see the propaganda campaigns that are poisoning our culture. There are the deaths of so many innocent civilians, both in Israel and in Gaza, and the remaining hostages, as I mentioned, that have not been released. What is our response to all of this? How can we fight the scourge of propaganda that damages us so deeply, except through education? One of the topics that you're going to hear about this evening is the form that Jewish resistance can take. What are the connections between what Jewish resistance could look like now and then? The program is about the music of terrorism and how resistance looked for Jewish artists during the Holocaust, whose artistic legacies have lived on due to the efforts of the Terrorism Music Foundation. What lessons can we learn from the musicians of terrorism and their insistence on living their true lives as artists despite what was happening to them? How do we move forward and how can they be an inspiration to us? A couple of thank yous and then I'm going to introduce the speakers. My deepest thanks to AJC New England, in particular Diane Lieberman, who's sitting right there. We really, we need to applaud for Diane because she's done so much work. And Rob Lichen also deserves some applause. They work tirelessly with us at BU to make these programs happen. And to the Consulate General of Israel to New England, our partner in these programs for many years. Finally, the hardworking staff at the Eloise El Center. If we applaud them, they won't hear us because they're still working outside. But let's do it anyway, especially Teresa Kooning. Let me introduce Mark Ludwig. He's executive director and founder of the Terrorism Music Foundation, and he's a Boston Symphony Orchestra member emeritus who blends his musical career with social causes promoting tolerance. He's performed on numerous CDs and in concerts to benefit causes in the US, Bosnia, Darfur, Tibet, and Europe. For his global outreach efforts, he was nominated to be a UNESCO Artist for Peace and Goodwill Ambassador. He founded the, music, the Terrorism Music Foundation in 1991 and has authored essays, program notes, and a Holocaust curriculum for schools and universities. In addition to serving on the Terrorism Memorial Museum Advisory Board, Mark Ludwig has consulted for numerous international cultural organizations and symphony orchestras. He's participated as an artist, a consultant, and a producer in CD recordings, and NPR, BBC World Radio, and ABC World News have showcased the work of Mark Ludwig and the Terrazin Music Foundation. Please join me in welcoming Mark. Thank you very much. Victor Ullmann wrote in his Terrazin essay, Goethe in the Ghetto, the following. I would only like to emphasize that my musical work was fostered and not inhibited by Theresienstadt and that we in no way merely sat around lamenting by the banks of Babylon's rivers, and that our desire for culture was equal to our will to live. Those last four words, our will to live, were the credo of composer Victor Ullmann and his fellow artist in prison in the Terezin concentration camp. 
It also inspired my book and the journey we are about to take this evening. I want to briefly take you back to the 1980s, to the origins of my journey into this extraordinary world. One afternoon before playing a Boston Symphony concert at Carnegie Hall, and mind you, I have to tell you that artists, we all have our pre-concert routines. Now, mine in New York was thumbing through music at the long gone Adelson Music Store, or browsing on the shelves in the Strand Bookstore. And on one occasion, I came across the biography of Rabbi Leo Beck, who I was surprised to read was imprisoned in the Theresienstadt concentration camp. Two lines in the chapter titled Theresienstadt caught my attention. The very first one was, poets and musicians try to capture the hunger, cold, and sadness in words and music. And this was later followed by a composer, Victor Ullmann, was noted for writing an opera in the camp. So like many of you, I immediately wondered, who was this Victor Ullmann and these musicians and poets in Terezin? And did any of their work survive? A few months later, driven by these questions, I was walking down Parzyska Street and this is a beautiful boulevard lined with Art Nouveau buildings in the fabled Jewish quarter of Prague. Now, at that time, Prague was about to come out of a dark half century of occupation, first by the Nazis, followed by the Soviets. Hoping to find remnants of this lost repertoire, I entered the Czech Music Fund in Prague. Now, this was the central repository for Czech music. And imagine this, the director hands me several scores to examine. And this is one of them. This music was unpublished, and it was just, this was music I'd never seen, and composers I'd never heard of. So I want to get my hands on it. And I ask, can I take some home? Do you have copies? And they looked at me, and, and I said, could you Xerox it? Now, I'm already dating myself by saying Xerox, right? <clears throat> but <clears throat> I said Xerox to them, and I might as well come from the moon. They said, don't worry. Give us your address. We'll send you the music. You'll get it in about a month or two. So I get a pile of music, and it's all handwritten. I mean, it's unbelievable, hand copied, right? But I want to take you back to that moment that I'm looking through the scores, because I worked my way through them, hearing the interplay of voices in my mind's ear. I was thunderstruck by the beauty, sophistication, and power of these works created by people who daily face suffering and mortality. And this was music beyond my expectations. In fact, I couldn't wait to play it. So here it is 30 years later, and I'm still astonished how music, art, and poetry of such high order was created in a concentration camp. I mentioned a few of my first questions regarding this remarkable cultural community. But the one that continues to inspire my work was just posed by Nancy. What lessons can we learn from the musicians of Terezin? So before delving into this question, let's begin with an overview of Terezin. Terezin is situated 60 kilometers northwest of Prague. And on October 10th, 1780, Emperor Franz Joseph II laid the cornerstone of what would be two fortresses, <clears throat> a large and a small, to protect the Austro-Hungarian Empire from Prussian armies. With its diminishing military role, the large fortress became a quaint garrison town, as you can see in scenes in this charming turn of the century postcard. <clears throat> While the small fortress served a darker purpose, holding political and military prisoners like Soviet POWs in World War I, and most notably, Gabriel Princip, the assassin of Archduke Franz Ferdinand. In the late fall of 1941, the Nazis selected the large fortress as a quote-unquote ghetto settlement for Czech Jews, as exemplified by this work by a prisoner. So like the postcard, he included the same landmarks, the church, steeple, and the barracks, but he placed them within the camp's walls in the shape of a Jewish star. The first transport of 342 Jewish men arrived on November 24th to convert a garrison town of 7,500 people 
into a concentration camp that at one point held over 63,000 prisoners. Terezin's purpose expanded in scope and scale. Jews within the German Reich and occupied countries were sent to Terezin and ultimately to the east for extermination. More than 90,000 of the 141,000 Terezin prisoners were sent east. In addition to serving as a labor transit camp, Terezin later became a powerful propaganda vehicle for the Nazis who labeled Terezin a paradise ghetto. In 1944, they forced the prisoners to produce and participate in two propaganda projects, a staged International Red Cross visit and a propaganda film the survivors later called The Fuhrer Gives the Jews a City. Kurt Tyrone, who you see in this rendering from a Terezin artist, was a prisoner in the camp and he was forced to produce and direct the propaganda film. Before the war, he was famous for his roles singing Mack the Knife and acting alongside Marlena Dietrich in the film The Blue Angel. Fulfilling his task in Terezin, he was sent to the gas chambers of Auschwitz. This drawing was part of a series of stage scenes for Terezin's beautification that included an outdoor concert pavilion for bands like the Ghetto Swingers seen in this propaganda still, as well as facades of storefronts and a bank. And this is a photo of a transport entering Terezin. Prisoners arriving with bundles of up to 50 kilograms so for a moment, I want you to place yourself in this photograph and consider what would you select? What would you take to an unknown destination? I mean, there are the essentials of clothing, food, medications. But what I find is really remarkable is that so many amateur and professional musicians chose to smuggle in musical instruments. Now this was perilous because as the Nuremberg racial laws forbade the ownership of instruments by Jews in the Reich and in occupied lands. And these are among, I'm going to emphasize this, hundreds of thousands of instruments that were confiscated. So think for a moment. You're about to hear a cellist play it later, but how do you smuggle a cello into a camp? And, and the idea of somebody cutting it into pieces, putting it into the lining of their clothing, and this is risking their life because being caught, you are sent to the east, which is almost a certain death sentence. And then think about, for any of you who have an instrument, you have a relationship with that instrument. You play it. And to now cut it, and it devalues it, that's on one end, all right? But the idea to smuggle it in and then glue it back together, this is, to me, unbelievable courage and determination. Now, at first, the, the, the prisoners secretly held informal concerts. And becoming aware of these activities, the Nazis swung between periods of prohibition and indifference, eventually co-opting them for their propaganda purposes. With the growing number of transports, a remarkable and unparalleled cultural community developed amidst the daily reality of starvation, disease, lack of adequate medical care, in overcrowding where over 33,000 people died. My challenge in writing Our Will to Live was finding a way to bring not only the reader of this book, but now you, the audience, into this rich world while avoiding the pitfalls of a dry, fact-laden account of this community. How best to bring these artists out of the shadow of distant memory? And I believe I found this through the Terezin concert critiques and writings of Victor Ullmann, a composer and prisoner. He will be our guide, much like the poet Virgil was to Dante in his Divine Comedy, taking us into an unimaginable world. Further enriching our experience will be artwork created by the prisoners documenting the cultural activities. They are part of some 500 works that were collected by this man, Karl Hermann, who was a member of Terezin's Jewish administrative leadership. In October 1944, Hermann and Ullmann 
received transport notices to Auschwitz. Both men made fateful decisions to leave their most valued possessions behind. Ullmann entrusted his manuscripts to a friend, while Hermann hid this artwork under the floorboards and in the walls of the barracks. Miraculously, they were recovered after the war. So before sampling excerpts from Ullmann's critiques with artwork and then performances by Greg, Noriko, and Aaron, I'd like to touch on Ullmann and the scope of his critiques. This is Victor Ullmann, and he's sitting at the 50th birthday celebration of his mentor, Arnold Schoenberg. He was part of Schoenberg's Viennese circle. And, and I love this photograph because take a look at this young man and the confidence, the elegance, the elan. This is a person who's showing they're on a promising career path as a composer, a conductor, and a pianist. Ullmann was deported to Terezin on September 8, 1942, where he soon became a towering cultural figure as a composer and producer of chamber concerts. I want you to take a quick look at these names, and some of them you'll recognize. But <clears throat> So Ullmann studied with Schoenberg, uh, Alice Haba, um, then, of course, Bruno Walter was a, a great conductor, but he was an assistant to Gustav Mahler. And all of these composers were deemed degenerate in the, by the Third Reich. So in a, one of many surrealistic twists in this concentration camp, there was greater artistic freedom than in Nazi Germany because all the works of these composers were forbidden, and yet because the prisoners were not being really monitored by the SS guards. They were performing these works. <clears throat> Ullmann's critiques, he draws us into the performances held within the barracks. He wrote about stagings, a Carmen, Tusca, and Fledermaus, to name a few. But I want to caution you, because I talk about opera. You know, when you think about opera, you think of lavish sets, the, the, the costumes, the orchestra, all the music, all the logistics, right? And think about the audience, the elegance, and you think about an opera house with chandeliers. In a concentration camp, you don't have that pit orchestra. You have a pianist trying to play a reduction of the score. And then a lot of this music, the music's not necessarily brought in. So the great repository is one's memory. It's rather extraordinary that when you think of the adaptability of these people in this concentration camp. Ullmann, in his critiques, described instrumental and vocal recitals, choral and chamber music programs. His critiques introduce us to inspiring musicians who, like their fellow prisoners, shared the constant anxiety of transports to the East. They could perform one day, only to be sent to Auschwitz the following morning. Amidst this uncertainty, they continued to bring their fellow prisoners hope and a momentary escape from despair. One of those inspiring artists was the Czech composer Zygmunt Schul, whose music was deeply influenced by Hebrew melodies. Schul studied composition with Paul Hinnemuth and Alice Haba in Berlin before coming to Prague in 1935, where he researched and transcribed medieval Jewish musical manuscripts. Sent on one of the first transports in November 1941, he was an active member of the cultural and spiritual activities in Terezin. So from Victor Ullmann's Terezin critique, which is titled A Musical Panorama from mid-August 1944, he writes, lastly, the letter string quartet presented us with an enchantingly beautiful and excellently performed Haydn. It was followed by Zygmunt Schul's interesting well-crafted divertimento hebraico. Ullmann championed Schul's music, as you can see in this program, featuring, and it says, young composers, young Terezin composers. So upon Schul's death, Ullmann wrote this poignant tribute, the following. The composer Zygmunt Schul had died at 28 after a long lingering illness in Theresienstadt. One of those talents commonly called great hopes has left us. But Schul was more than a hope. 
Despite his youth, he possessed an astonishingly mature conception of music. Schul, doubly talented, was also a poet. And he goes on to close in his tribute. With Schul, we have lost a true personality, a true aspiring artistic personality. It is no eulogy cliche if I say that he was absolutely justified when he uttered shortly before his death, quote, what a pity this is what has come of me. It was the truth. So Norica and Aaron will now perform Shul's two Hasidic dances, dances exemplifying the unique spirit of this gifted young composer. Thank you. 
I'd like to briefly shift our attention to the visual artists who were so important to bearing witness to both the cultural activities and tremendous hardships in Terezin. Chronicling the deprivation and death in Terezin in the face of Nazi denial and propaganda resonates deeply in our times of info wars and disinformation. As you see, the graphics, design, and imagination are stunning. It reflects a tremendous pool of talent. Terezin artists were tasked with drafting construction plans, designing statistical charts, and illustrating official reports for the Nazi command. Many artists created decorative arts and paintings for the Terezin SS and their families. They were ordered to decorate selected sites and design worthless camp currencies in preparation for the 1944 Red Cross visit and the propaganda film production. You'll note the money's stereotypical Moses holding the Ten Commandments. This work gave these artists access to art supplies for their own creativity, but in some cases with tragic consequences. Visual artists took tremendous risks to document the harsh realities of terrorism. The most famous example is the dramatic story of Leo Haas, Bedrich Frieda, also known as Frieda Talsik, Otto Ungar, and Felix Bloch, whose drawings and paintings powerfully detail grim scenes of starvation, execution, sickness, overcrowding, and other aspects of daily life in the camp. Food and tobacco, among the key commodities for bartering within the camp, were smuggled in by members of the local Czech police. Through this pipeline, the artists managed to sneak works out. Several works found their way to Switzerland, encouraging the artists to intensify their efforts. Artists also hid a large portion of their remaining artwork inside the walls and under floorboards of the barracks. Friends buried some 200 works by Frida, and Leo Haas hid more than 400 works within the walls of the Magdeburg barracks. Following the discovery of the smuggled artwork and shortly after the Red Cross visit, the four artists were rounded up and sent to the cellar of the SS Commandant Karl Rahm's headquarters. Rahm, Adolf Eichmann, and two SS officers began the interrogation of the artists. They sent them to the small fortress with their spouses and children, three-year-old Tomasz Talsig in this drawing, and seven-year-old Susanna Ungarova for further interrogation and torture. There they beat Felix Bloch to death and crushed Ungar's drawing hand. Haas, Frieda, and Ungar were sent to Auschwitz. Frieda perished there, and Haas was ultimately liberated. He was the sole artist to survive. Haas returned to Terezin after the war and recovered his and Frieda's hidden artwork. He and his wife adopted little Tomaszek. As we turn to the music of Hans Kraza, we'll return later to a Terezin work of Tomaszek's father. And this is a Boston Symphony Orchestra program from November of 1926, in which Serge Kusevitsky conducted three performances of a symphony by a young Czech composer, Hans Karadza. The November 20th Boston Globe critique noted the audience response as, quote, a few in the audience were deeply grateful, a few actively annoyed. Even the musicians were annoyed. <laughs> the great majority seemed polite rather than interested. But nonetheless, this piece was among several artistic successes for the young Krasa with one critic proclaiming him as, quote, a fresh and exotic voice joining the company of Schoenberg, Bartok, and Weber. On the surface, Cross's relatively small compositional output is surprising considering the acclaim he received in Europe and America during the 1920s and 30s. But for one who enjoyed spending his days in cafes, playing chess, discussing literature and politics, He's basically your, your schmoozer, all right? His evenings were filled with music and theater. So composing was not Cross's sole priority. Ironically, his incarceration in Terezin dramatically channeled his energies towards composing. 
Following his transport on April 10, 1942, he was quickly, quickly enlisted to direct the activities of the Freizeitgestaltung, the Organization for Free Time Activities. This was a subset of the Jewish camp administration overseeing every cultural aspect within the camp, ranging from the sharing of musical instruments and sheet music to the scheduling of rehearsals and performances. But this went beyond music. It included lectures, chess matches, and all cultural mediums. In the critique titled The Children's Choir by Ullmann, he praises Rudolf Freudenfeld, who he says, quote, his achievements with Hans Cross's Brundelbar will not be forgotten for his loving work with the children of Theresienstadt. Ullmann is referring to Kraza's children's opera, Brundelbar, an opera he had composed for a Jewish orphanage in Prague in 1939. Under the Nazi prohibition of public performances by Jews, Freudenfeld directed a clandestine premiere in the orphanage. Like Kraza, Freudenfeld and the child performers were transported to Terezin. Kraza reworked the score for the instruments available, and there were 55 performances including staged ones for the summer of 1944. They were performing for their International Red Cross Committee visit and the production of the Nazi propaganda film. Unbeknownst to the Nazis, the text of the opera's finale was amended. Brundabar, the opera's mustachioed villain, was recasted as an anti-fascist metaphor for Hitler. So how surreal that the Nazis chose to film the finale of Brundabar with the children's chorus singing the following. Brundabar is defeated. We have beaten him, the tyrant mean. Play the drums. We have won because we didn't give in, because we all sang our happy song. So here's the finale segment from the propaganda film. It's really touching and I think back that we had two of those children who had survived perform at Symphony Hall at, at our gala. This was years ago where they sang with the Boston Children's Chorus this Brundabar finale. And what's really amazing is when you think about the number of children, we know that one and a half million children were murdered by the Nazis. <clears throat> but in Terezin, 15,000 children were sent to Auschwitz, and we, for what we think, is somewhere around 150 to 200 survived. So it's staggering, and to think that seeing those faces, most of those children, shortly after the production of that film, were sent to Auschwitz. So we just saw this work a few minutes ago, and it's by Frita. It's entitled Film Versus Reality. It is a Terezin allegory for what Primo Levi coined the gray zone, his term for when the oppressor forces the victim into the moral ambiguity of being an accomplice to their crimes. So to you see, if you really examine this closely, to the far right, you see the cameraman, and you notice the jackboot. So this is the power of the oppressor, right? And as you look closer, look at round here. This is the film coming from the canister, right? And it coils around the leg, and it comes up to what is the makeup lady, and she's a, clearly a prisoner. It's the Jewish star, right? She's in the gray zone. She has to take, 
she's making this person, she's preparing this prisoner for production of the propaganda film. So it's entitled Film Versus Reality, right? <clears throat> That's the film. This is the gray zone. And then here's the reality here. If you can make it out, it may be hard in the resolution here. This is an upside down skull. This is upside down skeleton. It's not even right side up. It's, so there's the messaging is very clear. And then you can see the barbed wire up top and the unmistakable characteristic of the walls of terrazine. So I draw your attention to this because it's the gray zone, but Krasa is also caught in that gray zone. Because shortly after the filming, Krasa and most of the children were sent to the gas chambers of Auschwitz. But think about that period during the filming. His music is being co-opted for a propaganda film. I mean, I can't imagine how Krasa internally navigated his gray zone containing this opera, the children, and the film. But I believe his very last work, his Pasakalian Fugue for String Trio, was his response to this gray zone. Just weeks after the Brundabar performances for the propaganda film, Krasa completed this trio. It was to be his final work. So before my colleagues perform this trio, I want to provide you with a roadmap of this remarkable work. So please welcome Greg, Noriko, and Aaron. And <laughs> There's a few things about the work. It's nine minutes, but this is, I dare say for most of you, it's the first time you've ever heard this piece. So if I can familiarize you with a little roadmap some of the things to think about and what to hear, because Krasa is giving us messages. He modeled this piece on Bach's famous C minor Pasticalia and Fugue for organ. And in Krasa's case, it's a nostalgic nod to high German culture in contrast to the barbaric Nazi regime. So a Pasticalia, it consists of a set of variations constructed on a continuous ostinato that usually appears in the bass line. So some of you may wonder, what's an ostinato? So you're getting a quick music 101 lesson here, all right? <clears throat> you better listen up. There's a test at the reception. I'm going to be going up to you. So what's an ostinato, all right? So it's from the Italian, but if you just use your ear, ostinato, obstinate. It's a musical phrase, harmony, or rhythmic pattern that's stated repeatedly, stubbornly, seemingly relentless like the grinding of an Nazi regime, right? Now, I'll give you something that you could really identify with. Uh, of the classic rhythmic ostinato, Ravel's Bolero. You've all heard Bolero, right? And it goes over and over, dum, da 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 dum, ba da da dum, bum, bum, ba da da dum, ba da da over, and then each instrument it comes in, and there's that ostinato. <clears throat> it has other connotations for us, but just think of it in terms of the contact with Cross's trio. So he opens with the eight bar ostinato in a cello. He employs a bit of subtle coding or messaging. The opening four notes of the ostinato is a concealed deus iri quote. So the ostinato evolves into an intimate lamentation between the three instruments in this trio. And this is followed with the viola introducing a rustic dance theme, hinting Moravian folk and klezmer overtones. <clears throat> so you have a duple meter syncopation which conflicts with triple. It's basically two against three. And it's between, you know, you're going to hear it between the two instruments, but let's hear the viola in this rustic motif. <laughs> And what you'll find is through this trio, as this keeps recycling, it becomes more aggressive in sound. It becomes louder, 
all right? You feel the tension growing. And in the eighth ostinato statement, Greg introduces a third theme. It's a real schmaltzy Viennese waltz. You hear a nostalgic old world elegance contrasted to the viola's rustic folk theme. It's like stepping into a black and white film, right? <clears throat> this is followed by a section of running 16th notes in the viola part against the cello's triplets, evoking images of trains. Now in Terezin, trains bore the dark, unsettling associations of separation, uncertainty, and even death. So you feel that friction about two against three, and there's that motor, that driving engine, all right? But there's that deus iure reference again in the Passacaglia theme that spirals into a fortissimo climax. It's filled with chaos and fear. But here is an ex excerpt from the coda where the violin and viola transition into a pianissimo otherworldly landscape. Their ascending chromatic fragments drift above the cello's eerie ghost-like harmonics. So this otherworldly spell is broken by the introduction of a fugue. And before you hear the performance of the whole trio, I just want to remark about the fugue. It's this Ataka statement. It breaks the spell of what you just heard. And it goes into what we call a perpetual immobile, which is filled with rapid fire, counterpunnel exchanges of the Dea Siri theme. And it really takes you where you feel like you're going towards reckless abandonment. The fugue closes with the cello, maniacally repeating the Passacaglia theme against the violin and viola shrieking a dance theme from an earlier terrorizing work by Crossa. It's a visceral and defiant rebuttal to a world of chaos and annihilation. It evolves into a totentance, a dance of death. And now you'll hear the complete work.
Ten weeks after completing this trio, 
Kraza was deported to Auschwitz with most of these children, along with fellow composers Gideon Klein, Victor Ullmann, and Pavel Haas, where he was murdered in the gas chambers. Now, many of us have had musical experiences of profound and existential pathos. For example, the Barber Adagio, Mahler symphonies, are those that come to mind. No matter how many times that I would perform this piece, is, it's always a challenge not to be overwhelmed by the heartbreaking sonorities of this transcendent trio. For me, it brings to mind a Hasidic teaching quoted by Rabbi Heschel. There are three ascending levels of how one mourns. With tears, that is the lowest. With silence, that is higher. And with a song, that is the highest. Cross's trio achieves that transcendent state. Ullmann stepped outside of classical music and covered the German and Czech cabaret productions in Terezin. And German shows tended toward the nostalgic, incorporating songs popular in Vienna and Berlin in the 1930s. The Czech productions focused more on satirical aspects of life in Terezin. Karl Schwenk was among the most popular of the cabaret artists, composing several productions in the camp. The first cabaret performed in Terezin, Schwenk's The Lost Food Card, included the Hail Terezin March. Adopted by the prisoners as the camp anthem, it declared the following, everything goes if there is a will. Tomorrow a new life starts, we'll pack up our bundles and go home and laugh on the ruins of the ghetto. In the critique, the Schwenk premiere, Ullmann praises Karl Schwenk, quote, as our Aristophanes of Theresienstadt, unfortunately, only rarely appears, even though he would have enough material, talent, and inventiveness to transform his annual contributions into a monthly review. And now, for a moment, Ullmann flashes a touch of his wit he puts in quotations, shake well before use. And he writes, that doesn't refer to the medicine this time around, but to the patient. After one and a half hours of shaking with laughter, it is entirely impossible to raise any critical objection with Carol Schwenk. He achieves the level of satire and thus true art. He was really enamored with this great talent. In this photo, I think you recognize one of the people, right? <clears throat> the gentleman at the piano is George Horner. And there's a couple stories on the story here on this photograph. So George is at the piano with Yo-Yo, but I met George back in the 90s. He lived near my parents in the suburbs of Philadelphia. Now George had been in Terezin and he played the accordion and the piano and he played a lot of pieces by Carol Schwenk. So he had survived Terezin and Auschwitz, but he never came out and spoke publicly about what he had experienced. Now he was a big aid to my research, especially about Cabaret and Terezin, and he would talk to me about these composers that he knew very well in the camp. And we had one day, and this took a while for him to really come out and share, but he says, you know, I have a few pieces by Schwenk. And he says, you really, you had the music? And he says, yeah, I do. So I get excited because I think, oh, I'm going to see the manuscript. How did he smuggle this out? So I said, can you show it to him? And he looks and he smiles and he says, I can't. They're up here, right? <clears throat> so I want to hear it. So he plays a little bit in his house. And on occasion, he would come over to my parents' house, and there was a period when my brother and I, we had just soloed with the orchestra. And my parents were holding a party after the concert. And in the living room, here comes George Horner, and he sits by their Steinway piano, and he starts playing cabaret tunes. And I'm recognizing the style of the composer. I think, this sounds like Schwenk, but I don't know these pieces. And it's these pieces that he was talking to me about, right? All right, so now, first time he's performed, 
for quite a while in public, and it's only in the living room. And I keep asking him each year, would you consider coming up to Symphony Hall and playing at a Tarazine Music Foundation gala? And he said, I can't do this, right? <clears throat> so, he's 90 years old. I call him, I'm excited, because for years I've been trying to get Yo-Yo to play, and he's been a really good friend, and he, he says, I'm gonna do a full program to raise funds for the foundation. So I tell George about it, and I said, George, this is a chance. You could be on the stage at Symphony Hall, and you could share it. And, and he says, I'll only do it if Yo-Yo plays with me, <laughs> right? <clears throat> this is chutzpah, right? You know, I mean, right? Uh, but I thought that was chutzpah. He took it yet to another level, because what's he do? So I'm worried. He's 90 years old. He hasn't performed in public in decades. So I don't know, about a week before, I said, George, do you have music? Are you going to put it out there? He says, no, no, I don't have to do that. I said, well, I mean, you probably will be fine, but you know, what if you have a memory lapse? He says, look, if the Nazis couldn't scare me, you think I'm going to be scared in Symphony Hall, right? I was like, OK. So he goes out there, and he plays three tunes with Yo-Yo, all right? You know what the hardest part was? Getting him off the stage afterwards, all right? <laughs> he had the time of his life. He didn't want to leave, all right? And it was great to see this 90-year-old man play these pieces. So two of those three pieces I want to talk to you about briefly. You know, I noted to you earlier that the Czech productions, which is Schwenk was of the Czech school, they tended to focus on life in Terezin. But one of these songs, and this one song he writes about, went beyond the walls of Terezin. I mean, here was this man, imprisoned, persecuted, ultimately facing the final solution, and yet he expressed solidarity with another oppressed people with this song, quote, why does the black man sit in the back of the tram? I mean, the walls of a concentration camp could not crush his empathy and compassion. This spirit extended to his fellow prisoners with another tune from that special evening in Symphony Hall, a lullaby. So this is a photo of a Terezin audience from the propaganda film. And as you listen to this soothing lullaby, just for a moment, put yourself in this photo. Try to imagine what this music would have meant to them.
So hearing that lullaby and reflecting upon these artists and their music, you can't help but return to the words of Victor Ullman that opened our program. Our desire for culture was equal to our will to live. And over the past three months, we are reminded of this as we learn of the lives of the murdered and the hostages of the Hamas attack in October. Like the victims of the Shoah, they're not just numbers, but people who before October 6th lived lives filled with a love of family, community, and in many cases, as Ulman wrote, a desire for culture. In these troubling times of intolerance and the rise of anti-Semitism, there is a special resonance in remembering and learning from the Shoah. Tonight, tonight the gifted artists of Tarazin step briefly out of the shadows of annihilation to share lessons for our time. A lesson above all, reminding us how precious and vital the arts are to our humanity. Thank you. Mark Ludwig and that amazing, amazing presentation. Um, and to the musicians too, thank you. I just now want to introduce Rob Lykin, who is the director of AGSA New England since 2008. He is a child of parents who survived Hitler's Europe. He grew up with a deeply rooted regard for the opportunity that American democracy offers Jews and other vulnerable minorities. Throughout his career, he's been a passionate defender of civil rights, an advocate in the fight against anti-Semitism, other forms of bigotry. No. Enough. <laughs> anyway, he's great. Thank you. <laughs> there are moments um, when the smartest thing you can do is sit down. Um, and I feel like this is one of those moments um, where I um, prepared some remarks. I can't do them. Um, Mark, that was just unbelievable. Thank you. Um, what I was thinking when you were up there teaching us, sharing with us, is that what a tremendous loss all this extraordinary people, the culture, the ideas, and how wonderful it is that you've brought them back to life. What a gift to all of us. So, so I, ju I just said I should sit down, but it's an occupational hazard. You'll forgive me if I say a few things. The, um, uh, First of all, I, I, I want to just say that together with Nancy and the Wiesel Center, we have been doing this event for how many years? 15 maybe? 15, 16 years, uh, every year. And we consider it really one of the most important things we do. We have a responsibility to preserve memory, to make sure that the memory is preserved that those who perished aren't forgotten. And so I feel every year when we do this in a very small, small way, all of us participating here today are doing that. I, and I thank you for your partnership. Um, we could never do it without Nancy, but these are, these are events that we look forward to and celebrate because they're deeply, deeply personal. When we, and it was Nancy's suggestion, of course, that we try this event today. When we did, I, I was um, thinking about what is it that we can learn? Are there any lessons to draw from this extraordinary story? And the thing that impressed me as I read about the musicians and the poets and the creative energy that happened in Theresienstadt 
was how different those circumstances are from ours today. Today, we are dealing with anti-Semitism. And we're dealing with a quality of anti-Semitism that I think probably nobody in this room is alive to remember was more typical than not before World War II. But we have grown up in a something of a golden age where what was normative became more muted, began to disappear. And we now live in an age where anti-Semitism is presenting itself in a myriad of different ways. And many of us have been lost and confused about how to respond. How do we understand the events? How do we understand how dangerous they are? How do we begin to make sense of events that we didn't anticipate, that we didn't really prepare our children for, that we didn't prepare our grandchildren for, and all of a sudden, they're increasingly a part of our reality. But in many respects, the reality we face pales in comparison to the reality that was faced by the inmates in Theresienstadt. There, they were faced with an overwhelming reality. As I understand it, one out of four people who went into Theresienstadt died there. The overwhelming, as Mark pointed out, the overwhelming majority of the others were sent to Auschwitz, where they perished. And yet, in that environment, in that environment, an environment that would ordinarily create despair, hopelessness, and a sense of overwhelming defeat. These artists, musicians, and others found the wherewithal to preserve and advance what is beautiful in life. And I imagine what kind of people can do that? Faced with the inevitability that was in front of them, the circumstances they were in, the sheer depravity of the circumstances they were in, they did that. And the word that came to mind as I thought about that, which is in the title of the program, is resistance. This idea that in the times we were in, that in, a, in an environment that was designed to dehumanize people, the ultimate resistance was to hang on to your humanity, to preserve that in the ways we could through use of creative energy, through an insistence that we will not be put down in the mire. And I think increasingly that's what many of us are involved in today. We at the American Jewish Committee are devoted to anti fighting anti-Semitism. Other organizations are doing the same today. And in a real sense, I hadn't thought of it in these terms, we're involved in a form of resistance. The normalization of anti-Semitism, the integration of anti-Semitic ideas that demonize and dehumanize Jewish people is happening again. It's happening in schools, it's happening in universities, it's happening in political discourse sometimes, and we're noticing it. We're noticing it and we're seeing it and many of us have become confused and worried and ultimately what we need to do is resist. And we do that in many ways. When I talk, we talk about our work, we're meeting with members of Congress. We have worked with the White House to develop a strategic plan to meet the challenge of anti-Semitism in this country. And we're proud of that, by the way. We have been working with young people giving them the tools, the conceptual and emotional tools to deal with adversity that frankly they didn't have. We're working in schools now where there are efforts to normalize curricula, 
that demonize the state of Israel, make it the avatar of all the sins of modern colonialism, um, and with it, demonize Jews. All of those things can be done. But what is most important today is something that I've noticed since October 7th. And that is that people are mobilizing. We're seeing synagogue groups organized to take, deal with anti-Semitism. In the last week alone, I've been approached by two young adult groups who've been working politically to fight the emergence of anti-Semitism and its expression through various political actions that are happening in municipalities around the state. This kind of mobilization, this kind of resistance, is what is needed in a moment like this. The anti-Semitism is not new. We often think about anti-Semitism in terms of incidents. I think it's the wrong way to think about it. The incidents that we see, that we describe as anti-Semitic, are the expression, the result of conspiracy theories about Jews. Conspiracy theories that have their origins going back to the first and second century, when the idea of Jews and Jewishness as a morally wanting community, morally wanting set of beliefs that pose a threat to good people. That idea has percolated and spread and found expression in thousands of ways, not only across Europe and, and North and South America, but also across centuries. And after World War II, it diminished for years, the Shoah made open hostility to Jews and obscenity. Today it is back. I think the lesson we get from the people who, who lived in Theresienstadt is that we have it within our power to resist. And we in the American Jewish community are a privileged and gifted community that has extraordinary resources to that purpose. So when I think about, when I think about this moment, when I think about this day, when I think about the events in Israel, I think it's a moment for all of us to gather our strength, gather our resolve, and meet the moment in ways that I know we can. Thank you so much. If you have questions written on our cards, please start waving them. If you don't have any questions, that's fine too. Um, if the musicians could take away their music stands, we're going to just, um, Rob and Mark are just going to sit over there and I'll field some questions, if there are any. Do we have a card? Write quickly. <laughs> please. I just want to pull up two chairs and sit right there. This is really mine. I think you're on the hot, in the hot seat all by yourself. So was that? <laughs> Why don't you have a seat? I think you're now. The, our panel of three just shrunk to one. So I think. I think so. <coughs> uh, any other questions? No. Okay. Oh. oh, she has a question. Oh, go ahead. Well, no, because it won't be on the it won't be on the Zoom. So I'll ask this question here. while we get a microphone right for you. Here. Shall we aim to get International Holocaust Day observed more broadly in cities and towns and in public schools? Isn't that something we all want to answer? Or, mm -hmm. or should we try to? Um, well, I, I'm speaking from my experience of traveling around the world to different spots where you wouldn't necessarily expect to have the Holocaust spoken about. Um, 
So I'll give you an, an, an example. Um, last year, <coughs> I was in Mongolia. So I, was, I did a couple of programs, but I, I also came as a person who was, um, well, I had been a member of the Boston Symphony. I was doing some master classes. But then I gave a couple of lectures about terrazine. And I don't know if you know much about Mongolia, but in this small, it's a large country with a small population, predominantly Buddhist, right? There is a, a Muslim contingent, and um, there are very few Jewish people. And in fact, the Mongolians that I met and I worked with, which I'd say about 50 or 60 of which, I probably was the first Jewish person they ever met. Right? And then talking about the, the history of not only these artists, but this idea of hatred, um, I could see with them there was a disconnect. Yeah, that's they, they didn't really understand that, you know, and, and, and especially for the younger generation, right? So, and I've found that in different pockets of the world where I've gone, um, you know, one, I become maybe the very first Jew that they meet. And they, some of them have preconceived notions, right? And some of them are not the best notions either, right? And, and what I, I'll tell you what I think is scary, and it's a challenge for us. Some of these people that I'm talking to you about are not evil people. These are people, they're living their day-to-day -day lives, but whatever their information source is, and this is critical, information source. We're finding this in our own country, but if you think about the source of information for people, whether they hear it on the internet, or they hear it by word of mouth, or they have some kind of conflict, whatever it is, right? And the fact is, we need dialogue, right? One of the things that I personally find is that during this period with Israel and Palestine, and Palestinians, the Israelis and Palestinians, and I'm not espousing a position right here now. You don't need to know my opinion. That's not it. But what I'm interested in is, how do you get dialogue going again? Because God knows, we're about to go into an election cycle where we are going to hear all these sides where nobody listens to each other, right? There's no respect anymore. It's just you're dug in, and you take the information that you want to hear. And I see this around the world all the time. So when you talk about like AGC, AJC, going into the schools, this is critical. Getting into the schools and getting back into the schools where kids can start getting used to the idea of not only dialogue, but being, doing rigorous research as to their sources. Where are they getting their information? And they need the tools for that. That's my ten, two cents, right? Yeah? Maybe? Oh, do you want to use this? Uh, no, it's all right. Um, several great questions have come in in the last couple of minutes. Um, I've got a quick one for you and then a couple of longer ones. How did they smuggle in a piano? <clears throat> so the first piano was actually in um, this gymnasium. And it, it wasn't any longer on piano legs. And there's this actually great account of this young composer, Gideon Klein. Imagine, he's in his early 20s. Um, an incredible talent as a pianist, conductor, composer, and educator. Who does he remind you of? Leonard Bernstein. And in fact, the survivors who knew him said he was our young Leonard Bernstein. Mm -hmm. And so there's this account where he's fixing this piano up. And imagine this piano, this rickety piano, on two sawhorses. Right? So they made do with what they could, right? Then eventually, when the, the Nazis decided they want to use the music of, of these, perf these performers and these composers for propaganda purposes, they brought in instruments. Because remember, they had confiscated thousands and thousands of instruments, and rather good instruments, too. So that's rather scary, too. But as a testament to these uh, musicians who smuggled in the instruments, I mean, that is really the bravery and then making do with what you had. Oh, one last thing. I showed you a photograph of the Ghetto Swingers. It was a jazz band. Mm. So you know what they use for uh, drums? Luggage, <laughs> right? They recycled everything in this camp. If there was anything that they could try to have a few costumes for some kind of production, is from scraps of whatever was around. 
All right, and the last thing I'll just say, think about how precious paper and a pencil was to write, whether it's writing poetry or music. This is incredible. We take it for granted. It's, it's so precious. Two more questions. Yeah. We only have a couple of minutes. Okay. Yeah. Winning lottery so, number, right? Yeah, go sorry. ahead. Well, yeah. So the first one is, is there music since the Shoah, about the Shoah, that you think is worthy? I'm going to give you both at once, okay? And the second is, what is the foundation doing to preserve and share musical scores with other musicians and orchestras and music schools? I don't know if you can blend those. Yeah. So is the music worthy? <clears throat> Um, yes, and in fact the goal is, over time, and it does take time, that these pieces, they will find their place in, and they are, they're finding their place in the standard canon of repertoire, performance repertoire. And when they are in programs of, say, Bach, Beethoven, Brahms, which they deserve, um, and we're getting there. It's taking years and years, but more and more people are performing. The foundation is a resource to ensembles and, and performers. And another thing we do, uh, we, in addition to going into schools for education programs, we commission works of young composers. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so we have a different model. I had a different model. Um, yes, you could put a monument up on, or a plaque. Here were these composers. You can have a building. But really, the greatest homage to these voices that were silenced is to start commissioning voices of today and tomorrow. And you put them side by side with pieces that were written in Terezin. And so as a result, then I pair it up with world famous artists like Yefim Bronfman, Don Upshaw, right, Garrick Olson, to name a few. And they go, and when they play around the world, I mean, think about it. If I told you, come to a concert to hear new music, how many of you would really come? You'd have some reservations, possibly. And I can't blame you, all right? But if I say to you, oh, but if you come to this concert that <clears throat> Jeff and Bronfman's playing, oh, I want to hear him play Beethoven. Oh, by the way, you're going to hear this new piece. And he's going to bring a couple thousand people in. They become the ambassadors. And more importantly, every time a Terezin piece is performed, you see in the program booklet the history. You can't avoid that. Thank you yeah. very much, Mark. Another Thank round of you. applause, please. Yeah. Thank you. I have one more introduction to make, one more short piece that I'm very, very pleased to be able to present this evening, which is Rabbi Joseph Pollock, who was the executive director of this Hillel for 46 years. Uh, he was already a wonderful writer, and then he went on after retirement to turn that into what seems like a full-time job. He, run, he wrote an incredible memoir, which I teach in my Holocaust literature course, called After the Holocaust, the Bells Still Ring, which is frankly one of the best memoirs I've ever read about his childhood experiences as a child survivor. So he is going to perform, sing, chant, El Malay Rachamim for us. Thank you. This is a prayer, so please rise. I'm going to sing it in the Hebrew, classical Hebrew, and then I'll tell you what it means, in case you don't know. El Molei Rachami Good 
putoyrim Cuz I har haraki ya Mayrim humazri La nisha mois Achaino bene Israel Hakdoi shim Viat hoyrim Shnoflo bidei Hanatsim haroitzim Ben ich pach domam Bauschwitz Maidanek Tebrinkla Sobibor Uvishar Machanois Hashemad Beyeropa Shenergo Vishen <laughs> Anachnu b'nei hem uvloisei hem, achei hem v'yachuisei hem, shebli neder noidrim tzdoko. V'yawawar haskoraz nishmoisei hem. Palurachomim Yastirei Beseyser Knofov Leyo Elamim Ve Yitrair Yitrair Hachayim Ez Nishmosom Adoinoi hu nachaloso wo 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 Piganei den te heimenu choso Vionu wo ko bisholoim dwelling on high, provide deep repose beneath the wings of thy indwelling presence, among the lofty heights, supernal, holy, and pure, whereby the souls of our brothers and sisters of Israel, who were slaughtered, whose blood was spilled by their Nazi murderers in Auschwitz, Majdanek, Treblinka, Sobibor, and all the other concentration camps of Europe. There were they murdered, in those ovens were they burnt, there were they buried alive, there did they suffer deaths of unfathomable cruelty while sanctifying thy holy name. We, their sons and daughters, and brothers and sisters, herewith Bli Neder, pledged tzedakah that their names not be forgotten. Shelter them unto eternity, O Master of mercy, in the comfort of thy divine wings. Bind their souls in the bonds of life. The Lord is their heritage. Grant them repose in the Garden of Edom. Let them rest in peace. And let us say, Amen.
thank you everyone for coming. Um, it seems like a terrible moment to invite you to the, a dessert reception, but perhaps there we can decompress a little bit. So thank you. Let's have another round of applause for our speakers. <laughs>